take seat on the knoppen. Uh, first, a short introduction about you, all of you. Uh, Pierre Laurent, you worked a lot with uh, Pierre Boulez, Olivier Messiaen, you were uh, the pianist of the Ensemble Intercontemporain. What is your relationship with Karl Stockhausen? Because Boulez and Stockhausen were the two icons, one could say, 20th century music. Well, uh, I've got the chance to make music quite often with him, starting with group pieces in Ensemble Intercontemporain when he came for directing the ensemble, pieces like Contrapunkte, Inori, etc. Um, through solo pieces that uh, work with him, or, uh, well, Manta, that we did on tour, he uh, being the Marcus Dropper of the tour <laughs> in the past. And what was also highly inspirational, uh, and also, uh, well, taking part of his opera, um, so there were a, a panel of different situations uh, and I must say the fact to observe the phenomenal musician that he was, um, visionary, uh, great architect of sounds, uh, um, a man living the acoustic situations, vibrating with sounds and well a big German organizer who could show articulation or a way to lead the form like nobody else was really very impressive. Very, um, I think he was a very impressive um, nature and, and person and gave immensely to, to people around him. I'm sorry, and? Gave immensely oh, gave. He was to a gave person. person too. Yes, oh. uh, Tamara, you grew up and studied in Yugoslavia. Um, was uh, Karl Hans Stockhausen then uh, considered an important composer in your country? I'm afraid to say no. We didn't even get to hear his pieces. I think there is a number of pieces, probably 99% of his pieces, that would have a world premiere still in Belgrade. And I didn't have any education on any new music whatsoever until I was 24 and I bumped into a master class by Piano Maima. So I was a complete virgin what new music is and uh, on one side, it, it does open a vision on a different way, so I think it's a, it's a nice combination to have someone who is from the family <laughs> and someone who comes from an outside world and can uh, make himself a new home. And did you work with Karl Stockhausen himself too? No, unfortunately mm -hmm. not. I worked with Boulez and with Kultak, but uh, I could have. I was living in Cologne at the moment. And somehow, uh, honestly, and I think it's important to note this, I, I did have a certain irritation with his music and with uh -huh. the whole personage, the whole thing, and I went to a lecture of him, and um, I was very rebellious at that moment, so I was the only one laughing, oh, God. because everyone was there with very respectful you know, ways, and I found some things that he said just not, uh, didn't match my conception of things. So to, uh, to take this road, well, 20 years after this kind of <laughs> first contact with him and his music, uh, for me, is very important because it, it came at the right moment now. I think before it could have been maybe too... too it was the wrong time still. It was the wrong time. Yeah. He was the kind of a person, he, someone introduced me and said my name, and he said, you're Russian. And oh, God, yeah. And mm -hmm. I said, no, and he said, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we, we came from a different way of seeing seeing things. He saw himself and the world that he conceived extremely seriously. And I'm from the Balkans where we see things always, also in a humorous way, there's always a, a different way. And Marco Stopper, you are Italian, but you also work with the Ensemble Intercontemporain. Uh, you led the IRCAM for a while. The IRCAM in Paris at the Institute for Onderzoek naar Electronica and Computers. Um, how was your relationship, or when did you first encounter, for instance, uh, Stockhausen? I didn't have the chance to work with him, that is, to play the electronics of his music with his being present. I had the chance to talk to people who worked with him, uh, especially Brian Wolf and Jan Panis, who is from the Netherlands. Geluidsman, die ook hier in the zaal is, ergens, toch? Jan Panis, heb ik gezien. Daar zit hij. 
doet heel vaak de elektronica, als er iets elektronisch moet gebeuren in Nederland, dan de champagne. Ja. And, 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 and I could get from them uh, what of course cannot be written in a score, because the score, the, also for the electronic, Strokazen was, and I think I always felt close to him, because I naturally thought the same way, although I'm from another generation, Strokazen was the only composer of that generation, of that quality and greatness, that understood that electronics is not just a sort of source that you add to your instrumental thinking, just to make it sound a bit more brilliant or a bit more exotic. But, uh, but really dealt with the electronic, went into it and understood that it was a new way of thinking about music and a new instrument. And, uh, and he focused on single elements and single electronic, uh, say, processes. Mantra has only one process, that's all. The whole piece, one hour and 15 minutes of music with one process of electronics. Nowadays, any young composer studying electronic music or even composition and doing a project in an electronic music studio could use, I don't know, 10, 15, effects at the same time, just because it's easy. Uh, but it was not as deep as Stockhausen did with only one. And uh, so I, I always felt, and uh, what Pierre Laurent said about Stockhausen's playing his own music, I attended his concerts when he came to Paris, and it was for me, uh, uh, um, I still have a memory of the kind of sound that he managed to get out of that. So you really have the feeling that the electronic was his instrument, that he was taking care of that exactly like a violin player is taking care of his violin. And, uh, and he had an ear for that, uh, but he didn't only have an ear for that, but he also had uh, the thought and the way of thinking that I could accompany this ear. And that's why his music, for me, is still so essential and still so new and modern, even if Mantra is a piece that is more than 45 years old. And it sounds as fresh and as, as new as he had written yesterday. Actually, even more because yesterday I think one doesn't write these kind of pieces anymore. Could, could a piece like that be written today? You think, either of you? Well, Jain, as well as say in, the, in German, yes, <laughs> yes and no, um, because also they are. I think Marco will not disagree. Many dimensions that reflects the end of the 60s, uh, and well, it's, it's a mix. I think like many great pieces. It is a mix of a certain moment with the cultural environment and of uh, eternity, yes, because somewhere it has such a vision and such a strength that it goes through any, any period of any era of music. Ja, het is het eerste stuk wat hij schreef volgens één formule. Het hele stuk is afgeleid van één, ja, twaalf toonsreeks die dan ook weer begint. Het begint en eindigt op een A, dus dan zijn het uiteindelijk dertien tonen. Dat is, zo hij base the entire piece mantra on one uh, 12 tone. I would like to listen to him zelf. Heeft iemand dat filmpje op internet gezien, op YouTube? Daar vertelt hij zeer uitvoerig over hoe hij uh, dat stuk uh, bedacht heeft, hoe hij het gemaakt heeft. En hier speelt hij het ook voor. He plays it as well, but it's very much out of tune, but that's the only thing. This is it the speaks song. about the meaning of mantra. The name of the composition mantra was clear fairly soon after I had thought about a composition for two pianos. The very first idea came in a car. We were four people in the car and I heard this melody that I wrote on uh, an envelope that I had in my pocket. melody has all the 12 different notes that one can find in an octave. When I was humming it, 
I tried to complete, the longer it lasted, the more notes I found, to complete it in a way that I used all the 12 notes. That was on the quad for men. Uh, these 12 notes, this is the, this is just the formula, this little melody is the beginning of the whole 70 minutes long stuk. Yes, you had a construction with an incredible level of organicity because everything uh, is born in the same egg, so to say. Uh, but each of these different forms and moments in the piece has a particular atmosphere, character, meaning, uh, so that the piece is also from an incredible uh, variety. And uh, Tamara he himself says that each of these 12 notes has a, one particular uh, characteristic. What, what kinds of characteristics are they? Well, it's a bit like to put it in very vulgar terms, but. Uh, you will get them the right picture. You have, when you're little, you cut out out of the paper uh, in the in those children books a person, and it's a person that has nothing. It's just legs and, and arms. And then you cut out all kinds of clothes. So you are now a policeman, and then you put then you work in a construction, and then you are a princess, and so on. So the same person gets a different life. And I think what's, what's very interesting is that it's not, it doesn't feel, when you play at least, uh, it doesn't feel artificial. It seems like you go to a journey and then suddenly the, the lunch of the paysage changes. And then you feel a different way. And so everything feels in the perspective of the sound. So I think the most beautiful thing is that you don't hear always the same thing. It's always there. But you don't perceive it and you say, oh, now it's like that. And now it's, it's not... Um, it's not, uh, in that sense, methodical to a point of being sterile. It seems that we're always making music with it. And Marco, do you, uh, when we listen to the piece, will we hear this little tune that he played for us? Will we recognize it in spite of all these new dresses? Uh, yeah, I know also. No, the, yeah. the, what he played is a skeleton of what he calls the mantra or a formula, which is for normal people just a kind of theme, nothing else than a, a company theme, a two voice theme. Now, uh, the difference is that this theme has, as Tamara said, different parts. Each part is very uh, clearly understandable by a certain situation. For example, the first note is not bam, is it bam, 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 bam. So it's it a repetition in it. Then you have other kinds, you have small notes accompanying all the other notes. So the theme is already in its presentation at the beginning of the piece, just after a couple of chords that they are just like a bell that announces the piece. And uh, uh, so the theme is already characterized by different parts that have, as Tamara said, different characters. And he develops that. So there will be a whole section that, for example, is based on repeated notes, because there is the idea of the repetition in the theme. And uh, for me, what is a bit incredible about this piece is that it is intellectually very, very constructed. Uh, it could be sterile if you just think about it, because it's really very constructed with this theme and each theme, and, and it is developed and it comes, so it's, it's just a pleasure to uh, observe how it is made, just from a purely conceptual, intellectual point of view. On the other hand, when you experience the piece, uh, for me it's like a poem symphonique. You go through a different different stages. There is a moment where it sounds almost tonal, it's in E flat major with a dominant pedal, sort of kind of gamelan kind of music because of the electronic. There are other moments that there is a frenzy toccata at the end, so pre crazy prestissimo, just before the coming back of the theme. So you can experience the piece without taking into account all the intellectual uh, construction that is there and makes its strength, of course, because the piece is solid and. Uh, just as a pure as a pure piece of music and in fo unfolding over one uh, hour and 15 minutes. That is really quite exceptional, I must say. Yeah, that are these crotales from the kleine uh, sort of beckentjes where they with a stock op op slaan. Tamara, how do you play them and where are they, these big crotales? Well, Bella has it on the side. I have them in the piano in front of me. So it's a bit like a table with, uh, with different plates, but you don't eat, you just... <laughs> put a sound into them. So it's a wonderful way of extending your range of sound as you can it, because we are so confined with the instruments that we have, of course the acoustics change, the piano is a bit different, but it's basically you get used to and you start copying your own sound. 
So to work on this piece with the ring modulation and with the all differences that you can make with the sound, the electronics, plus the percussion, it's, it's an incredible journey for any kind of musician to, to be able to create um, like those, you know, the, the, the one-man orchestra and so. Yeah, yeah, the song warm, it's yeah. Yeah, it's warm and, and so the ring modulation, is that what you do? That you hear the performing of the tone, that happens through the ring modulation. First, what exactly is that ring modulation and what do you do and is it prescribed exactly? Oh yeah, it's very completely, completely, definitely written. Now, the, to, to make it easy, it was a very popular effect in the 60s and the 70s. Now, ring modulation is nothing else than a fast crescendo and diminuendo. Imagine you ask a player to play and a crescendo and diminuendo. So, but very fast, 100 times a second. So I can't do it. I, I can't breathe so fast. But, but so, I, I think that's a wah-wah effect with the pop uh, musicians. Yes, use. I, no, uh, wah-wah is another effect. It's a change of timbre. Uh, it's oh, wah, yeah. wah, mm -hmm. wah without change of amplitude. Okay. okay. And uh, uh, ring modulation is such a question on any one. Very fast. Now there is an effect for our perception. That uh, uh, when it is so fast, of course we cannot hear the question on any one anymore. But uh, because our ear cannot follow this crescendo di minuendo so fast, we hear other pitches, other sounds around the main sound of the piano. Depending on the relationship between how fast the ring modulation is, so the crescendo di minuendo is, and which notes of the piano is played, that is totally computed in the score, uh, you may hear a sound that is quite close to the sound of the piano, or a sound that goes away from the sound of the piano and gets into the sound of the bell. So this piano is constantly, uh, I say, traveling between the piano and the bell, and the piano and the bell, more or less clear. And there are some moments in the piece that are really spectacular about that. There are some moments where Stockhausen shows this, uh, this uh, say, uh, frequency added to the sound. There are some moments where you hear just a, a, a set of bells on the high register of the piano. There are moments where the piano is more, more like, like, like a piano. So, this, so he studied the effect, which is very simple, very, 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 very easy. And uh, uh, to, to understand, he studied the consequences and the result of the musical uh, effect, and he composed with that extremely, extremely carefully and extremely intelligently. And how about you? Do you have any, because sometimes it almost sounds as if it improvised, do you have any uh, space to improvise, to make your own sound, and for instance, to use the symbols or the wood block? No, uh, uh, it's extremely defined and guided, so to say. So we feel guided completely. There are some moments when, let's say, he opens a small window for a certain freedom. For instance, uh, in the way to uh, work on the transformation of the sound, at some moments we play very loud words, so there is a lot of resonance, and then we vary the sound injected to our sounds that we modify it so that the transformation is like designed by us and this is more or less free he guides us so so, so how I didn't quite understand that so you you play a sound and then you change it before Marco does the ring modulation no, life what well, we have an iPad <coughs> and then you'll see us doing this Ah, because in the internet I saw uh, yes. a film and that was all, they had this little, they, like they, I have here. They've done this, yeah. like what we've done with the radio before, oh, so okay. I guess it's up, <laughs> dated now, so we do this now. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you amplify or what you do? Well, we have a, a choice, we have a margin of how much we can do. Well, in order to create the effect, stop me Marco if I say stupidity, the effect that Marco has spoken about, one should bring the piano sound into a box, into a machine, and to modify it, to inject a sinus sound uh, in order to create this result. And the sinus sounds will be always different. So for each of the 13, 12 plus 1 sections of the piece, each of them corresponds into one note of the, of the mantra, there is one different sinus sounds mm -hmm. each well and in fact these sinus sounds make a melody that is the mantra that means the, the transformation okay. so it is structured by the mantra itself 
transformation of the monetary structure that the market sector. And well, we control this sound is sound, so for each section we will look for the next sound and try to find it well, and sometimes we play with it. So we can travel, make designs carrying the pitch of the sound, or make small tremolo go around the sound, etc. Et so then each time it is performed, it may be a bit different from the time. A bit different, time. yes. Uh -huh. okay. But in a frame of a very defined structure of music. Well, if it gives you colors with which to do the makeup, but you didn't do your makeup in, in the way you want. Yes, sir. But the colors are... Given. And so how is the sound picked up from, because the, the piano is an acoustic instrument, so how do you get your tones into this little machine? Is that via microphones? Yeah, very easily. There are seven microphones around the different parts of the piano. The seven microphones are sent to me and, uh, I mean, to the, to, and behind to the computer through, through a mixing board. And uh, in the, com the computer receives uh, the sound and mixes them with the uh, with the sounds live. I'm responsible for the for the mixture of them, so the balance of them. I'm like a conductor. I don't really play an instrument. I control the overall dynamic shapes of what is being played by the effect by the computer and by the pianists uh, themselves. And uh, during this process, the pianists will have to change some of the controls of the ring modulator, some of the frequencies. So they do it in a, with a hand. At that time, in the 70s, when the piece was composed, everything was, of course, handmade, uh, custom-made. Now the original controllers don't exist anymore, and, and if they had existed, they would not work anymore anyway. And, uh, and nowadays, it's very easy, it's just going through wireless uh, from me to the pianists, and, uh, and, the, and you control it to iPads. So it's much more... But the, the gesture is, of course, both reproduced to be, to be the same. You just throw a <laughs> finger on, on an iPad rather than turning a knob or a dial on, on a physical machine. But the principle is, is the same. The control is more refined nowadays, of course, but the principle is we, we, we did not we just updated the say the say modern version in terms of the instruments of the piece, but the music is the same. Actually, to a certain extent it's an open discussion but even sounds better. Better now, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, is there also room for um, theatrical aspects apart from your playing the symbols? Yes, I, when I opened the score, I said, unfortunately, there is, but now I'm enjoying it immensely. And that, that was the part you didn't like about Stockhausen humor. It was it was a different kind of humor because it's very written out humor. So, so there is a moment where we uh, should I say or yeah. should we be surprised? Okay, so we yell at each other. No. Uh, we, yeah, we have got that. I've got that somewhere. No, we have a very like Wagnerian uh, range uh, that we go from one note to the other with our voices, and we stand up and we hit the wood block. But once we hit it together, and then after each other, so you will think that we made a mistake, but we are right. And then there is a third time, no fourth time, where I start, but he doesn't. So in the score, it's written. Look at your partner angrily, <laughs> and this is very difficult because the distance is huge. So I don't know. I, I will try my best, but there are these moments. It's a bit like a written-out cabaret version, which is more difficult than improvised. So, of course, I go higher up. And, and it sounds as if here, in this recording, there are more than two voices. Is that ring modulated yes. too? Aha! You, you, how, so, how do you do that? And have you got an own choice to...? They set the frequency of the ring so the, of the speed of the crescendo diminuendo, which is very fast. Normally, the speed of music, so uh, A, B, C, normally tones of music. So imagine a crescendo and diminuendo, uh, 300 times a second. You can't hear the 300 times, but you hear these other voices. So whatever sound it is sent, uh, a piano cannot make a uh, the, uh, this sound in the same way. So this effect is a bit unique to the voice, and I think this is also intelligent uh, to show what the ring modulation sound can do in a way that the piano can never achieve. He has chosen the sound. So it's, it's, a, it's an intelligent way of, of, of staging 
dramaturgically uh, the effect of the sounds. You have this feeling that one, one voice is going down, there are other voices that go up and down. Actually, there are two main voices that accompany the main voice uh, that are going up and down in different directions. So, um, how do you study a score like this? How long do it take you to learn the score? Well, very simply, you, you just try to make music with it all the time. And that means to <clears throat> bring the sounds to life and to articulate them in the, the right way. It means, first of all, I think in this music there is an incredible sense for the sounds themselves. So you have to realize them the best you can. And in order to serve the, the, the imagination of the composer, that you get the right poetic here, or the right character there, etc. And then, because it is formed so well by a great architect, you have to speak in the right way to articulate the phrases, so that you don't have single notes, but really phrases sometimes interrupted, sometimes very long, sometimes combined. Uh, and well, this phrasing, like in many music, will give shape to music, to form, and um, of course this is very important for such a, uh, a music from an architect somewhere, is to, to keep, the, one say, the big form, not only the big form, but all the forms, the form of each of the sections and the big general arch, so that you have this extraordinary feeling of a non-stop piece of 75 minutes for piano, when uh, did that happen, not every day, of course. And tomorrow, is it not confusing to have to play the piano, to have to uh, to do you know, the ring, or not not the ring, but the sounds, uh, and, and to do you know, the the crotales, etc. Now you just reminded me that yes, it is scary. <laughs> I <laughs> forgot it for a moment. <laughs> no, I think uh, what's so about the learning the piece for me is difficult because uh, I play quite a lot of new music at work. It's called new music, so every time you open a new score. <coughs> You think like, okay, how can I take the complexity in and how can I go through the, the forest and find the essence? And here the essence was the first thing. So I was flipping through notes and like, okay, where is the difficult stuff? <laughs> where is it? And how can I work with it? And I think this um, simplicity is the wrong word, but this, this clarity was so strong that it took me took me off of it at the beginning, so I had to find a way how to move around in it. And of course, once you practice alone without the rhythm modulation, it sounds a bit too simple. So it makes no it sense. Makes no sense. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the more we play, and the beautiful thing about this playing in the concert, you don't feel that you're performing, but you're just going on a journey with the public, and it doesn't feel like a you know a heroic. Act. It really feels like you're making music with everyone in the hall. I see we have to stop. One final question to you. It, it says indeed that the audience almost is part of the performance. In, in what way is that conceived? Imagine that you have in front of you a huge instrument that is made of two pianos and five loudspeakers around you. They're all fused in the same space. All the sound comes from the stage. There is no sound like often in electronic pieces where the loudspeakers are in the hall and then you hear the sound turning around your heads and so on. But there you have just in front of you a huge stage and made of these, say, sound generators, which two pianos and five loudspeakers, and, uh, and this uh, huge instrument uh, metamorphi metamorphosizes itself into different kinds of colors that a piano alone or two pianos alone never can achieve. Uh, they say, that's the travel, that's the journey, and it's up to you to experience it. Okay, thank you very much, you and Hill, Frank, and good luck with the concert. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. Thank you.